brought to you by Head Start Basketball. When a kid comes in to my office and says, Coach, why am I not playing? I go, come on. There's one of two reasons you're not playing. One, I like you and you're not playing because I don't think you're any good. Or two, you are really good and I think you're a really bad guy. And I can't afford to play you because it would lose credibility with the team. It's one of those two reasons. You know, so, I mean, why else, as long as you think I'm trying to win, you know that's one of the two reasons I'm not playing you. Now, can I help you fix those reasons? Sure. You know, I mean, I, I can help you become a way better player. So as long as we can sit down and go through what you need to do to become a way better player, then I'll like you and you'll be good. So I'll definitely play. You. Now, if you're already good, but I don't play you because I think you're a really bad guy, I, I can tell you why I think you're a really bad guy and the things you've done to indicate that you are not a great guy. And then you got to decide whether you're going to stop doing those things. But I'm not going to play you until you stop doing those things. Coach Dave Smart built one of the most dominant dynasties in collegiate sport history. He served as the head men's basketball coach at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada from 1999 to 2019, where he led the Ravens to 13 of the team's 14 U Sports National Championships in men's basketball. Smart has also served as an assistant coach with the Canadian men's national team on multiple occasions. Coach Smart took over the Ravens program in 1999-2000 and won 92% of his games against Canadian opposition between 1999 and 2019. He led the Ravens to a Canadian men's record of 87 consecutive wins in league and playoff games from 2002 to 2005. Smart has been named the Canadian Collegiate Basketball Coach of the Year a record 8 times and the OUA Conference Coach of the Year award 13 times. On March 19th, 2019, Dave Smart stepped down as head coach of the Carleton University Ravens men's basketball team, accepting a new position with the university, director of basketball operations. Make sure you subscribe to the Hoopheads podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Your ratings help your friends and coaching colleagues find the show. If you really love what you're hearing, please recommend the Hoopheads pod to someone and get them to join you as a part of Hoopheads Nation. Trust me when I say that you are definitely going to want to take some notes as you listen to this episode with Coach Dave Smart from Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Pets Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the program from Carleton University, Dave Smart. Dave, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate yeah, it. We are, we are very excited to have you on talk about some of the things that you've done with your teams and your players that's enabled you to have a tremendous amount of success at the university level there in Canada. Dave, talk to us about how you got into the game of basketball when you were a kid and what first attracted you to the game. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the thing that probably attracted me to it, I, I was really a hockey guy and, and a baseball guy, a little bit, a little bit of football, but uh my brother played at university and, and I went and he's, he's quite a bit older than I am, uh, about 17 years older than I was. So I was quite young when I saw him at university, but you know, I, I, I obviously looked up to him and he was playing university basketball. So I, I was always sort of in the back of my mind to play, but I didn't start playing. I didn't play in my, for my first competitive basketball until I was 16. And, uh, because I was playing, triple uh, a hockey and i was playing playing baseball and i was playing baseball at a reasonably high level and i and i enjoyed it so i spent most of my time doing that and then uh when i started playing basketball I, it it came pretty naturally to me i mean i, I wasn't wasn't great right away but it, it came pretty quick considering how late i started especially by today's standards um you know and then i i when i went to university i went to queen's university in, in kingston canada and uh uh, again, I, I had, I guess some people would say a good university career. I, I, I led the country in scoring, but I wasn't a very good player. Like looking back at it, I just, I, I scored a ton of points, but we were about 500 and, you know, I, I preach with my guys to do winning things, winning things. And, and I mean, obviously putting the ball in the basket is part of winning things, but beyond that, I don't think I did any 
other real winning things. I mean, I think I defended when I when I felt I had to. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm not really sure I rebounded at the level I needed to. I'm not sure I got to the loose balls I needed to. I'm not sure I communicated at the level I needed to. And I certainly don't know if I was a great leader when I played. Um, but I could score a bit. So, I mean, I, there, there was a bit of a misnomer that I could play. But really, <laughs> I, I could just put the ball in the basket a bit. And, you know, and then, then after university, I thought it would be a cool idea to play pro. And I went to New Zealand for a short time. But then I realized that I, I really didn't want to play. And, uh, but I, I really like coaching. Um, you know, because I had been coaching while I was playing. I had been coaching club teams. And before that, high school team, and uh, and I really enjoyed it, and I missed not doing it anymore. Um, but again, it, it was one of those things where the the playing was fun, but but the 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 coaching was more something I wanted to learn. And I, and it wasn't necessarily just basketball. I, I would have been willing to to coach hockey. I would have been willing to coach baseball. I mean, whatever was the easiest for me to get into and it just happened to be basketball opportunities presented themselves so i that's that's how it started all right two questions one anybody who's played anywhere overseas we always like to ask do you have a crazy new zealand basketball story from the short-lived time that you were playing in new zealand uh yeah i mean a couple but i not not that i'm gonna uh share that my <laughs> players could uh, use against me. I mean, I, 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 as I said, I went there liking the game and, and you know, kind of liking playing, but not loving playing. I went there more for the experience. And at, at, uh, at that time in my life, the experience wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, going to history uh, museums and things like that so i mean I, I i had a good time when i was there but it, it also woke me up to the fact that it wasn't something that i really wanted to do to try to make make a, a long-term a long-term thing for me and i and i didn't know if i could i mean I, I think looking back i'm not sure i could have on the other hand looking back i didn't play for very long and i got reasonably talented reasonably quick so maybe i could have kept improving and then maybe i could have but it really just wasn't something i wanted to do but i'm not telling you anything so you can ask understood <laughs> <laughs> understood that could be a crazy story just in and of itself um all right so what was it about the coaching piece of it that made you say man this is what i want to do regardless of whether it was basketball or one of the other sports what was it about just the process of coaching that made you feel like, hey, this is what's something that I want to get into. That's something I could do for the rest of my life. Well, it's funny. I mean, I, I feel like as a coach, less so maybe in basketball um, at the highest levels, but but certainly in in most team sports, I felt like the coach had more control over the outcome of the game. You know, more prep time, more more control over who plays, who doesn't play. Uh, I mean, in hockey, you know, especially. If you're running shifts, it's it's 15 skaters. You only have so much of an impact, and and you know baseball even less unless you're a pitcher. Um, you know, so ironically, I kept I picked the sport where the actual player has more control over it than the other team sports. But I, I really liked sort of the strategy of it, and I like the competition. For me, I never really loved hockey. I never really loved basketball. I really never loved baseball. I never really loved golf and I was a, a scratch golfer, but I really liked the competition of everything. So for coaching, it's, it, it, I would have coached anything and just loved sort of the competition of it, and the, the trying to figure out how to win. And I figured that I could stay in the competition of it for a lot longer time and, you know, than I could as a player. And my, I figured my playing time, no matter what I did, you know, minus golf, but I wasn't good enough at golf uh, would have ended at, at around 30. Whereas coaching, you know, you can do it for as long as you're dumb enough to keep doing it. <laughs> All right. So let's start there. Competitiveness. How do you instill competitiveness in your players as individuals and as your team collectively? What are some of the things that you do from a practice design standpoint that enable you to build competitiveness into everything that you do. Let's talk about some of those things. 
Well, I think it's a combination. I mean, I don't think, I think, I think my feeling on it is the coaches who, who feel like uh, the best way to get people to compete is to reward them for competing and just reward the ones who are competing and don't, don't make it negative at all. I, I think if that's all you're doing, it's wrong. But if you're not doing that, you're wrong too. I think the coaches who just punish the people who don't compete or don't win, um, I think that's wrong. I think it's a, it, it changes day to day and you got to read your personalities and read, read what drives them. You know, I, I mean, uh, some people are naturally more competitive than others and, you know, you don't have to punish them or reward them. In fact, well, I mean, the punishment is losing enough. I mean, some, some of the guys, you know, they'll lose and, and they'll go to do whatever our normal punishment might be that day, whether it's running or push-ups, depending on how competitive we were in our last game. And some of the guys, when they lose in a practice drill, they go to do that, and I just tell them they're not allowed to do it. And that, and it's, it's a, I just say, well, I mean, you you weren't competitive on Saturday. You're not competitive today. What what good does running do? Like, just, you know, I mean, whatever. We're just having fun. But I do that to the guys who are very competitive, and it pisses them off more than I'm saying that, they don't need to run. They don't need to do push-ups because they're not competitive enough to be worthy of it. And that annoys them, and that gets them at a much higher level the next drill or the next competition they're they're in. And that's ultimately the goal. I mean, so, some guys, you know, they truly don't really care if they win or lose. So sometimes it's them running that they may, they hate running so much, and you do it enough in practice when when you lose because we don't do any running as part of our conditioning it, it, the only time we run is if i feel like they don't care about they don't hate losing enough so i i gotta make them hate losing and it, some of them you do it long enough and they just naturally start hating losing because they they assume running comes with it but you know it, it it changes drill to drill it changes day to day it changes person to person but ultimately they gotta i mean some guys you just let the rest of the team run and let them watch because they care so much about the teammates but they don't really care about winning or losing but all of a sudden they start caring about winning and losing when their teammates get punished and it's you know they're the ones who are arguing like why are they running a sprint and i don't get to when i was on their team and i go well because you caused them to lose so i want you to watch them run because you caused them to lose and they go well that's not fair i mean i go well on saturday when we play, are you going to cause them to lose? Because they're not going to have to run, but they're going to feel really bad, and you're not. <laughs> but now, you're, now if you understand how badly they're going to feel if they lose, maybe you'll feel bad for different reasons than they'll feel bad, and we'll all try to win. You know, everybody wants to win for different reasons. Some just want to win. Some don't want to let their teammates down. Whatever the reason, you just need to get them to compete. So how do you go about diagnosing that in each player for lack of a better way of saying it how do you find out what makes each guy tick and how long does that process take from the moment you first start coaching them as a freshman until you have a pretty good handle on which guy needs which type of which which type of punishment or which type of coaching style uh, how, how long does that take i i mean again it takes less time now than it did it did uh, 30 years ago. Um, although it, it's funny because 30 years ago, I probably spent even more time communicating with the guys and talking to them. I mean, I still spend a ton of time communicating, talking to them, trying to get to know what's what's on their mind, like listening to them more than talking to them. I mean, asking questions and then sitting back and listening and and trying to get a feel for what what makes them tick and i'm way better at figuring it out earlier but 30 years ago uh, it was easier to start those conversations because i had more in common i was younger i wasn't the old man talking to him <laughs> that i am now you know so it's it's weird because you'd think it would be a lot easier now than it was then but it was easier to talk to them then harder to figure them out now it's easier to figure them out but harder to get into those those real conversations so you know, I mean, it takes, I think, to really know probably six six months to a year to really know what what where they're thinking in terms of their competitiveness, in terms of their fight, in terms of their want. 
to be to to win their want to be special their 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 need to keep their teammates happy you know all, all those things and and it's different for everybody and every, different things make different people tick but generally when they get to the university level they're, they're, there's a reason they compete you just got to figure out what it is and it's not the same for everybody are those conversations do they take place in a formal matter or informal manner uh, are those things that you're just doing on a daily basis on the practice floor? Uh, are you meeting with players on a regular basis? What does that, what do those conversations look like from your point of view? The ideal situation is to press the right buttons to really piss them off. Once, <laughs> once you press the right buttons to really piss them off, where they feel uh, comfortable enough to say what they really want to say to you, then it turns into a formal, con a, a real conversation where everybody's calm and you, 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 you you need to get the honesty first. Most coaches, you know, like most coaches never get the honesty because they're they're they want to believe that everything's cool and ever and everybody's happy. Well, not everybody's not happy. I mean, if, first of all, if if you're starting five are happy, then they're probably complacent and they're not probably they're probably not doing the things they need to do to to really help you win. But if you're if you're your bench guys aren't happy. I mean, they, and if they are, then that's a problem. So <laughs> you get yep. to a point where you understand that they're, they're comfortable telling you the truth. And, and once you get there, then it's easier to get a feel for what makes them tick and, and what, what gets them to compete. So how do you get there? How do you get there where your players trust you enough to say, Hey coach, this is what's going on. Or, Hey coach, I think this is, happening and it's wrong or I don't like this or here's what we need to do. How do you get to that point where everybody is has that completely radical honesty with one another where nobody's nobody's holding back and you're having those true honest conversations? Because obviously if you don't get to that point, then you never get to some of the things you're describing in terms of how you find out what people tick. So how do you develop that ability to communicate so raw and so honestly with with going that conversation going back and forth between coaches to player players to players to coach well i mean it changes every individual it changes i mean the the, the biggest thing is for me it's the first step is obviously they they have to trust me they don't have to like me but they have to trust me and, and you know so 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 there's no there's no bullshit i mean like if it's it's like when a when a kid comes in to my office and says coach, why am I not playing? I go, come on. There's one of two reasons you're not playing. One, I like you and you're not playing because I don't think you're any good. Or two, you are really good and I think you're a really bad guy and I can't <laughs> afford to play you because it would lose credibility with the team. It's one of those two reasons. You know, so I mean, why else, as long as you think I'm trying to win, you know that's one of the two reasons I'm not playing you. Now, can I help you fix those reasons? Sure. You know, I mean, I, I can help you become a way better player. So as long as we can sit down and go through what you need to do to become a way better player, then I'll like you and you'll be good, so I'll definitely play you. Now, if you're already good, but I don't play you because I think you're a really bad guy, I can tell you why I think you're a really bad guy and the things you've done to indicate that you are not a great guy. And then you got to decide whether you're going to stop doing those things, but I'm not going to play until you stop doing those things. So, I mean, but, but I go, the, the question is kind of dumb. Like you can come into my office and say, I'm going to stop being a bad guy. If you believe you're a great player, or you can come into my office and say, coach, I got to get better. What, what can I do to get better? That would be a more logical way to start this conversation because everybody in our team room knows why they're playing and why they're not playing. And it's, it, it really comes down to two things. And, and I mean, it's the same. I coach my nine year old in hockey and you know, wh why kids play, why kids don't play. Well, either kids not good enough and he's a wonderful kid, but he's just not good enough or yeah, he's as good as you think he is, but he's a pain in the neck. So he to play. <laughs> like it's, it's not, if 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 he's really good and he's a good kid, he's gonna play. How do kids who first come into your program with you, how do they react to the level of directness that maybe they're not used to 
from other coaches that they've been around uh, and they come in and they have this direct conversation with you where, you know, hey, what do I need to work on? And I'm sure you can give them a list of 25 things just like any other coach would who was being directly honest. But a lot of times, you know, that doesn't happen. So how does a kid react to those first couple conversations with you when you're being brutally honest with them about where they are both as a, a competitor and as a player? Well, I mean, it starts in the recruiting process. You know, I mean, it, it's one of those things where in the recruiting process, it's you ask the question with their parents there, how good do you think you are? And a lot of them say, well, I think I'm, I'm good enough to be a pro. And I go, well, clearly Mike Krzyzewski and John Calipari do not think you're good enough <laughs> because they haven't showed up here. And if they thought you were good enough to be a pro, they'd be here. They'd be at least talking to you. I, I, to, to get to a point where I'm talking to you and no one in the SEC and no one in the ACC is talking to you, every one of those coaches is indirectly telling you, you are not a pro. So let's, let's start from, at this moment, you are not a play, pro. So do I think you could become a pro? Yeah, I think you could become a pro. But first step is recognizing you're not a pro and wanting to become a pro and wanting to do the things necessary to become a pro. I, I've, you know, as I said, I, I say to them that we've, we've got a ton of guys who have become pros. None of them were pros when they got here or they wouldn't have come here. You know, they, they would have gone to Kentucky. They would have gone to Duke. So, you know, like it, it starts there. So they, they already know like that I go, I, that I think they are of the potential to be great, but potential doesn't mean anything. So, and at this point, you know, clearly they're not great or they'd be getting recruited by high, high level teams. Yeah, no question. All right. Talk about the four different types of players that you see and what each of those types of players, the impact that they have on their team and sort of the repercussions of what each one of those player types means for you as a coach. Yeah, I mean, I've got it. I've got my thoughts on the four, four groups of people and it's not just on a team. It's just generally anywhere in a workplace, anywhere. And, and, you know, but with a team with a competitive team, you, you really don't have to deal with group four. Um, so there's really only three groups with, with a competitive team, but ba basically, and we talk about this team, we start, we put, bring the team into the, into our meeting room. And we say like, guys, we're going to go through the groups. Just know everybody has you in a group. Like everybody, they're not going to tell you what group they have you in, <laughs> but they all have you in the group. They all have an opinion. And I'm guessing that there's going to be a 90% agreement on what group each one of you deserve to be in. And, you know, we just say the first group is the guy who's really talented, really smart, and thinks he's really talented and thinks he's really smart. And you know what? I guess you need those guys on your team because – you don't want to throw away incredible talents and incredibly high IQ players. I mean, that's in the business world. That's ever anywhere. But to be honest, they're the guys who are going to get the coach, the manager, whoever fired because they're not going to get any better. They're not going to try as hard as they can. So even though they are incredibly talented and incredibly smart, their work ethic is probably going to be stink because they think they're pretty smart. They think they're pretty talented. So it's a catch-22. You got to keep them, but you got to change them because if you don't change them, they're, you're going to get fired. And then there's the second group who are really talented, really smart, high IQ, and they don't necessarily think they're that talented or they don't, they don't think they're that smart. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're the ones who are going to work their butts off to get to that level because they really are pretty humble about it. Now, do you have to deal with some things with them? Sure. You got to, you got to deal a little bit with their confidence level and everybody says, well, that's a big thing. Well, not really when you're in that group, that's really talented and you got a high IQ because you really just have to watch tape of them kicking the crap out of other people to get them to realize how good they are. And you can tell them how good that, that that's the difference. You can tell that group how good they are because they're never ultimately going to believe you. You know, they, because that's not in their nature. Their nature is to be humble. They're the ones who make you coach of the year. They are the ones who win you national championships. They're the ones who make you look like 
you can really, really coach because they're really talented and they get a ton out of their talent talent and they keep getting better every day. So they make you look good. They're really easy to coach. Most people can coach them. Most people can't recruit them, but most people can coach them. You know, most people aren't smart enough to recognize who those people are and more importantly, can't recognize who group one are and they recruit way too many ones and not enough twos. And then they don't recruit enough number threes who aren't that talented, aren't that smart, but they know it. They know they're not that talented. They know they're they're not naturally gifted in terms of IQ, but they want it so bad and they will do anything to get there and they will do anything you ask. They will do anything the team asks. They will do anything that the team needs and they're the ones that group one they like because they're not really a threat to group one but anyone in group one who has any kind of like caring at all for the for their teammates sees how hard they work and how much they care so it can get group one to actually buy in when their buddies who aren't a threat to them in terms of minutes and in terms of like exposure or whatever are doing so much um to 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 help the team so you can use group three to get to group one group two doesn't affect group one because group one just sort of look they see them as a threat so they they don't they don't care to to work hard like them the the only way you can use group two to get to group one is they're going to pass you soon so and and that helps but it also hurts because it causes a bit of a fragment in the team too because because there's a, a threat there and sometimes you need that threat but you know, the group three, I just don't think enough coaches even consider recruiting those guys. And they make your team. They're the base of your team. They're the backbone of your team. They're, they're the reason you win because everybody wants to play at a high level for that group. And then, you know, there's always the group four people who we all deal with. I don't have to deal with in my walk of life because I can just cut them. But the <laughs> ones who aren't very talented, they're not very smart, but they think they're really talented and they're convinced they're really smart. In, in competitive basketball, you just cut them, you know, and, and you move on. You know, sometimes in some walks of life, you can't cut them and you have to deal with them and you got to figure out a way. And, man, I, I can't imagine how, how you deal with that type of person because I've never had to really deal with that person. But I, I would assume it would be a nightmare because they're not really giving you anything because they stink. And, and they think they're good, so they're annoying and they stink. So I, 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 it's not... <laughs> not a great group to be in really group group two and three are the groups you want to be in and you want to get group all of group one into group two and if you can do that you 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 can be really special a really special team so how do you use your players to how do you develop the leadership skills in them where they're holding one another accountable i know that accountability is something that you believe in it at every level of your team so how do you help the players understand how to hold one another accountable uh when they're out on the practice floor in games how do you go about doing that and and making sure that they're doing it in the way that is going to benefit the team as opposed to tearing it down well first of all the the first step is before before you even figure out what the relationships are and who, who can yell at who and who shouldn't yell at who and who's yelling at who for the right reasons. You gotta, you gotta yell for the right reasons. And they gotta know, like they, you gotta get on your team. Sorry, I say yell, whatever. You, you need to get on your teammates, whatever that way is within your personality. But you gotta do it for the right reasons. You know, effort, effort reasons, not running their lane hard, not, not defending as hard as they possibly can, not communicating as much as they possibly can, not rebounding. Those are things, you know, the, the, the turning the ball over the missing shots, you know, the, the bobbling a pass, you know, no one's trying to do that. Everybody, everybody's trying to make shots. Everybody's trying to, no one's trying to turn the ball over. Everybody's trying to catch the ball. The turnover thing is a bit iffy because sometimes the turnovers can be because people are trying to do way too much and trying to look, look like the star doing it and it's costing your team. So there are times where the type of pass can be, can be uh, like uh, dealt with, but it really the fact that someone's trying to pass, they're trying to make complete the pass. No one's not, no one's trying to throw the pass away. No one's trying to turn the ball over. It's just sometimes 
they don't really care if they turn it over as long as they look good. And same things with shots. I mean, it's the it's the type of shot, not whether it goes in. And the, the important thing is, if it's a shot you want people to take, you got to make sure when they miss it that you make it really, really clear that that's the shot that they want that you want them to take. Because if they miss it, they might stop taking it. And if they stop taking good shots, you're going to lose. So it's one of those things where where you have to be you have to be positive and you have to be negative if you really want to have a great culture. And so every one of our possessions in practice, I get a little annoyed if there's not positive reinforcement and there's not negative reinforcement from both teams, you know, because usually something good and something bad has happened, you know, it, it like it, almost always. So if someone takes a bad shot and makes it, their teammates should be on them for taking a bad shot because God knows they're going to take that shot again because it went in unless you make it very clear that that's a terrible shot. <laughs> and, you know, it, so so you want to stop them from shooting it. But on the other hand, if it's a tough shot and you defend it the way you want, you got to tell your teammates, no, that's perfect. That's what we want them doing. If they keep doing it, we're going to win. So don't, don't get away from that. Don't just make them keep taking that bad shot. So sometimes when there's a negative result, there's a positive reinforcement. Sometimes when there's a positive result, there's a negative reinforcement. And, and, but, but, you know, if people don't rebound, you got to get on them, but every play, something good and something bad happened to each team. So that's the communication I expect. And so, so like people say, well, there's a lot of negative, negative interaction in your practices. Yep. And there's a lot of positive interaction in our practices. There's 50, 50, there's as much negative, as there is positive, and if there isn't, then I got a real problem with it. If there's too much positive, then why are we ignoring the negative? And if there's too much negative, clearly there has to be positive. Someone's someone's doing well if someone's doing poorly. So do you model that for your players, or is it now to the point where they had that your upperclassmen are just doing it so naturally that as play, new players come into the program – they just see the way it's done, or do you actually talk about what you want the talk to look like between between players? How does that piece of it work? Well, we talk about how we want it to look like, so that the young guys understand what's going on, like uh, so they're not shocked by it, so that we've already communicated it. But you know, and we still have to talk about it because it's case by case. I mean, some some of our veterans do a great job of it. Some of them just yell for the sake of yelling, and they don't have a relationship with the guy they're yelling at. And to me, if you're yelling at someone you don't have a relationship with, then you're just bullying them. Like you're not, you're not leading them. There's a, you, you can be negative and lead. Like I know it's 2019 and everybody says you <laughs> can't, but you can be negative and, and, and lead, but you have to be negative with the people who are the closest to you. I mean, it's, it's, you, you're, you're going to, you scream and yell at your brothers. I got a, I got a six or seven, nine year old and, they scream at each other all the time. But if you ask them who their best friend is, most days, some days not, but most days they, they say each other, you know, so, you know, that's, that's a relationship that's healthy. They, they, they can yell at each other because they love each other. And, you know, I have no problem with the guys who are really close and have become really close and love each other to be yelling at each other. If they're not, then are they really that close? Like if they can't say the negative as well as the positive, are they that close? But if I see a guy, who is yelling at a guy and the guy who's getting yelled at is not reacting well, I'll go to one of them and say, so what's your relationship? Like, how close are you? And if it's not real close, and if the guy who, who's sort of getting it doesn't say, no, no, it's fine, we're close, we've talked about it, I screwed up, we, I, I messed up, I have zero problem with that, then I'm fine with it. And, and I'll, but I'll ask other guys on the team what their relationship's like if I sense that it's not a good interaction and sometimes it's like i don't know how good the, the relationship is so i'll go to the guy who was negative and go you have no right like find someone else to deal with them that way because you, you haven't built the relationship and if you haven't built the relationship you're you're not you're not going to talk to them that way but on, on the other hand you can talk to someone else who he's really really close with the exact same way the next day and i'm good with it so it, it's all about understanding the relationships and working hard to to understand the relationships and it's a lot of work i mean it's it's a lot of time it's a lot of work it's a lot of listening it's a lot of listening to your to to the players and trying to trying to get get the real message 
Yeah, I think the thing that I'm pulling out of this more than anything else is just the fact that basically everything that you're doing and that you want your players to do is based upon understanding each individual player and what makes them tick. That's both from a player to coach relationship and now also a player to player relationship. And when you can build that understanding so that everyone has some degree of a relationship, then it becomes much easier for everyone to hold everyone else accountable as opposed to when there's a disconnect, it becomes much more difficult to hold one another to, to high standards. Is that a good way of summarizing it? Yeah. And, and again, like it's, it's just building those relationships. And sometimes when it's a coach player relationship, it's tough. I mean, all, all of meetings with guys and I'll, I'll just randomly, like, I'll be on a guy like watching film and, and I'll be on, I'm telling him all the things he did lousy. And, and, uh, and I'll say, so what do you think? What do you think of your coach? I think you're good. I think you're good. And I'll, and I'll just stop and I'll take my iPad out and I'll get the camera and I go, and I'll reverse the camera and I go, you know what? Man, you're right. Like, I am really a good looking guy. And I'm <laughs> definitely doing I clearly don't make any mistakes. Like, I get it. I get it why when I give you a chance to make fun of me, you don't really make fun of me because there's nothing to make fun of. I'm perfect. I mean, like, obviously, it's it's tough. I feel bad that I say so many bad things to you about how you play because, I mean, it, it must be tough hearing it from someone who never makes a mistake. And they'll laugh and I'll go, seriously, what is your problem with me? Coach, I, I like playing. I didn't ask if I like coaching you, but I got lots of problems with you. <laughs> I love coaching you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade you for the world, but I still think you do a lot of things lousy. So I, I get it. You like playing for me. What don't you like? What pisses you off? What would you like to make fun of? Like, can we get to a point where when I give you a hard time, you'll give me a hard time? And sometimes that's the most important thing is that you can have that type of relationship and it leads to people actually having real, real conversations. You know, I, I give these guys a hard time. They give me a hard time. And, 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 but you know, they know the line and they know that I, I say to them once, once practice starts, unfortunately, I'm the only one who gets to talk uh, in terms of, of coaching and being negative. But as soon as that two hours is over, it's free reign again, but we're not going to waste time having long discussions in practice because gym time's gold. But other than that, we got lots of time to, to, to have real conversations. So I think you got to, everybody has to do it their own way. You know, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it gets easier when you get married because then you realize just all your, your deficiencies because <laughs> <more often. laughs> Jason and I can relate uh, to that. I definitely can relate. I'm, yeah. So, I mean, when the players tell you stuff, it's like, ah, I've heard this a million times. It's really, it's going to be hard to hurt me. Yeah, it's not the right, it's not, it's nothing new. It's nothing I haven't heard many, 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 many times. Exactly. For sure. And that was just today. <laughs> Registration is now open at www.headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps this summer in Strongsville, Westlake, Avon Lake, Oberlin, Brunswick, Highland Heights, Mentor, and Hudson. At Head Start Basketball, we care deeply about making a positive impact on the lives of young basketball players, both on and off the court. It's through building strong relationships with our players, parents, and coaching staff that we are able to use the game of basketball to enrich the lives of those we interact with, both inside and outside of our organization. We believe that our attention to detail, our growth mindset, and our commitment to lifelong learning allows us to help our players achieve their fullest potential. We are passionately committed to providing players, parents, and coaches with everything they need to reach their goals. These core values run through everything we do. Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, and discover why you should attend a Head Start Basketball Camp this summer. Hope to see you there. When you set up the relationship for being able to have that type of honesty with one another i think one of the things that it does is it brings those problems when they do exist i'm guessing that they come to light much more quickly for your teams 
than they might for a coach who doesn't handle these things in the same manner. Uh, I'm guessing that when problems arise, whatever those problems might be, that you're able to probably sniff them out pretty quickly simply because of the fact that you're having these transparent conversations with players all the time and the players are having them with one another. And it just seems like rather than having something fester, it seems like that things just are going to come out much, much, much easier. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is I hate big problems, but I love little problems. Like, I love problems. I love when we have issues. I feel like it's hard to be complacent when you figured out problems. So sometimes I make up problems, but I like the problems, whereas I think a lot of people naturally don't love dealing with problems. And ironically, it ends up being a way bigger problem down the road. Sometimes it becomes a bigger problem because you let, you don't, you pretend it's not happening, then it just blows up. Sometimes it's just in terms of coaching, you lose because you've tried to pretend those problems weren't there. You know, we, we lost one game this year and we, we spent the entire first half of the, top of the season talking about how horrible we were every single day, talking about it, every single day, talking about how, there is no way we can win three games in three days with the way we're doing things. It, it, there is no way. This is because of this, 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 this. And we just talked about every problem. And we didn't pretend anything good was happening ever. I mean, it was if we, if we won by 50, it was like, you know, well, that's fine. It's easy to win when, when everything's going your way. It, it doesn't mean anything. We still have these other problems that we see every day in practice. You know, like we, we don't fight through adversity. We don't – we – we lose our confidence quickly. We all sorts of things. I mean, we 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 won't we won't make it uncomfortable as much as possible, so that when it becomes uncomfortable, we're, we're, it's going to be new to us. I mean, we're we, all these things we talked about every day, and like to nauseam. And and it, I I know other coaches sit there and go, why do you, how do you find so many problems? Like, I mean, people get tired of talking to me when I'm talking about all the problems we have. Because they go, well, you lost one game. <laughs> like, like cry me a river. And I'm going, yeah, in fairness, but I, we have these problems. They're real. I go, like, it, a lot of the coaches start talking like, yeah, we're, we look, we're looking good in practice. And I'm going, how the heck does anyone look good in practice? Like, how do you know you look good in practice? I, I don't understand it. You're playing against each other. So somebody looks bad. And if nobody looks bad and nobody looks good, then you all look okay. But how can you tell that's good? Like, I can't tell if it's good compared to Cincinnati if we're playing Cincinnati. I just know that no one looks bad, no one looks good, but it's my team. And we could all be really, really bad. Or, you know what? I guess we could be really, really good. But uh, I think if I assume we're really, really good, we're probably going to get killed. And if I assume we're really, really bad, then we'll keep working and getting better. And maybe we won't get killed. But I, I love. I, I've coached probably 10,000 practices, and I've heard, yeah, we had a good practice. And I'm going, oh my god, I've never, <laughs> I've never had a good practice. I've, and and now I do focus on the negative more than I focus on the positive. But I don't understand how you can't either have average practices or bad practices, like bad energy, bad practices, or you know, high energy, which is most practices, hopefully, but it's still not good because one team's bad and one team's good. Or, you know, like I said, everybody's equal. And what does that mean? That means we're all we we could all stick. So how do you create that uncomfortableness, those problems in practice to put your players in a position where they're going to experience things? in your practice that are going to prepare them for those uncomfortable situations in games. What are some things, is there anything specific that you do to set up or create those problems for your players to solve throughout your practices? Well, I mean, first of all, we talk about them owning their own confidence all the time, like not, not allowing anyone, uh, someone on the other team, a coach, uh, any situation, anyone, anyone to be able to own their own confidence and steal their confidence. So, that we talk about that in the recruiting process. We're going to test your confidence. So if you don't want to be tested, don't come. Like it, it does, if, if you want to be, if you want to be a much better person, a much stronger person, and better person. But I, I think 
I think they can go most places and become a better person, just like we, I think, make them better people. I don't think that's that's inclusive to us. Where I do think is, I think our guys at the end of their five years are way stronger because they've been put through so many situations where their their confidence is tested and they have to figure out a way to own their own confidence. And, and you know, we, we talk about it. So, you know, with my fourth and fifth year guys, they walk off the floor and I say to them, I won. Or they say to me, I won today, coach. I go, that might be the dumbest thing you've ever said because it's true. I did not take your confidence away, but it means tomorrow is going to be crazy. <laughs> I go, and, and some of them say, that's why I said it. And I said, good, because it's going to be nuts. And, you know, so so we try to put them in in as many tough situations, but you also got to, you got to push the buttons. You got to know what, what gets guys to compete. And, and uh, again, like I, I, I have a nine year old and a, a, a six year old who just turned seven. He, he's, and, and with them, they play competitive hockey. They put, play competitive basketball with the, with the nine year old. He's, he's like his mom. He's a really, really nice kid really good kid and cares a ton all the time. Not, I'm not saying the other one doesn't, but he's more like his dad and isn't his thought. He doesn't think as much as he should, but the older one all the time. So whenever he's not performing at the highest level, I just say to him, I feel like you're kind of letting your, your buddies down, like your, your teammates down, like they need you and you're not really kind of feeling sorry for yourself. You're not really playing at the level that you're capable of playing. And it's going to cost your buddies the game if you don't like play at a higher level. And he nine out of 10 times response because all he cares, he don't, it, it's not for him. He just doesn't want to let his buddies down. So he'll, he'll change how he approaches it. He'll stop thinking about himself. The younger one, not so much. I mean, he, he, he looks at it a little differently. He, he just wants to be the best. So whenever he's playing lousy, I just go, wow, that kid in Toronto, I think he's two or three steps ahead of you right now. I don't know. I feel like you're falling pretty far behind him. And that fires him up, and he just gets majorly focused. And 15 minutes later, later he'll say, Dad, you think you're still better than me? I go, I think you're getting there. I'm still going to do what I did, but 15 minutes later, do you, think, you still think he's better than me? And then I'll say, well, I think you're tied. And, you know, like for him, it's just uh, he wants to be the best. And... and He's, I mean, my kid, so I think he's a wonderful kid, but he, he does definitely have my personality in him, so he gets, he gets overly better. And, and, but, but again, you can press that, push that button to get, what you, to get what's best for him out of it. So you're doing that same thing with your players on a daily basis, individually, yeah. talking about different ways that you can challenge them in a drill. So maybe you're walking up to somebody after a particular drill and, and you know what you need to say to that guy to push his buttons to get yes. him motivated for the next drill or the next whatever it is that you're doing. And some of them, it's as simple as kind of let your teammates down that drill because they're nice kids. And it's like, oh, shoot. And it's like, stop worrying about yourself and just do the things necessary to win. And don't let your teammates down. And then they generally respond. You know, I mean, you got to change it up because they get, they you say the same thing over and over again. They know what you're saying. So sometimes, like, you got to be real about it. And so they like, say, so I'm saying this, you've heard it a million times. Now you're, you're not responding to it because you've heard it a million times, but you're still letting your teammates down. Like, are you a good guy or are you not? Because I think you're a good guy. Sometimes you got to go that deep. And some guys, it's just, you know, it's simply put, he kicked your butt last drill. And you know that if you say that, that he's going to come back to differently. And it's different with every guy and it's different day to day. And sometimes they respond the way you expect them to respond. And sometimes they don't, if they don't, I mean, experience helps, but you have to change your approach and you know, experience definitely helps, but you're not going to get experience if you don't do it every single day and, and care about the competition facet every single day. Talk about your philosophy when it comes to, your players shooting both their opportunity to shoot and then what your expectations are for them to improve as shooters and how you go about setting that up as a competitive 
situation within your team? Well, I mean, I mean, we do we do a lot of things um, to improve our shooting because the game is is basically now centered around shooting. But uh, we we do a shooting chart for, in terms of of everybody is given a certain role based on where they are in the shooting chart. And this is for practice games. Games all change it up because you know some guys some guys are you know, some guys take it more seriously than others, but they still have to go through the hell of being low on the shooting chart and, and not getting to shoot threes in practices, even if they're good shooters, if they don't take the shooting chart seriously. So it, it, it makes practice a whole lot less fun. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, you know, cut my nose off uh, uh, trying to make a point here. I'm, I like it. It's, it if we get in the game, the best shooters are going to be put in a position where, they shoot in certain situations and the weaker shooters don't. But in practice, it's all based on our shooting chart. And since we practice five times more than we play, it becomes a bit of a nightmare if you're not high on the shooting chart. So, you know, if you're in the top three in the shooting chart, first of all, you can shoot at any time you have any kind of open shot. And, you know, you can debate over what an open shot is and what an open shot isn't, you know? So, so you, you have pretty much free reign in practice to shoot threes if you're in the top three on the shooting chart. If you're four, and when you make a three, you get three points plus an extra three points. So you get six points every time you make a three. So people are searching threes because they get six points. They get double the points every time they make a three. Um, if you're four to six, then you can't shoot until the ball gets to eight feet. So in other words, the ball's got to either get to the post or be penetrated to to eight feet of the basket and then once it's kicked out you're allowed to shoot it but when you do shoot it if you make it you get three points plus an extra two points so anytime the ball gets to eight feet you're searching you're not you're generally not making the one plus one you're you're searching that shot so guys are fighting to to be in that that position and it helps in our defensive philosophy in terms of knowing the scout and making guys making guys do what you what they don't want to do and taking them away from their strength so you know it it sort of kills two birds with one stone and then seven to to nine it's the same deal the ball gets to eight feet and kicked out you can shoot it but you only get one extra point if if you make a three and then 10 to 10 to 12 you only get three if you make it but you're generally a diver if you're 10 to 12 and 13 to, to 16 or 17, whoever, whatever's left. If you make a three, it doesn't count for anything. So you can shoot as many as you want. It doesn't count for anything. You get zero points. You get nothing in a practice. So you, you might as well not bother shooting a three. So if you're not in the top 12, you never get to shoot a three. If you're 10 to 12, you probably might get one three a practice. If you're seven to nine, you know you probably you probably get to shoot in, in game situations. Ten threes of practice, four to six, twenty five, one to three, probably seventy threes, sixty fifty fifty to seventy threes of practice uh, in the game situations. Yeah, not not counting our our drilling of shooting. So we do the shooting chart, and they got to shoot one hundred and fifty threes against the gets the partner whatever type of threes they, the the person who's higher on the list wants to shoot and uh, if you win you move up you can only move up one spot at a time and you can challenge guys anytime you want and that's done outside of practice inside your practice outside how does that of, work outside of practice gotcha. gotcha so some guys are shooting a ridiculous amount of threes every week because they're just challenging guys non-stop so that their practices are more fun I've got guys who, when we start the shooting chart, so we start everybody fresh and we do a 500 shot challenge type thing, they start at number one in the shooting chart, but they never challenge anybody. So they win, win, but they lose, and they win, win, and then they lose, they win, win, they lose. And they're the best shooters on our team, but they're 12th on the shooting chart because they never challenge them. And once they get lower on the challenge on the shooting chart, no one ever challenges them because no one needs to pass them. Right. So, right. So there are. So 
you know, I mean, they're, they're just incredibly lazy. And all I say to them is, <laughs> Hey, I get it. You were number one. And now you th still think you're a better shooter than all those guys. But if you miss a big three, when it matters for us, I'm not sure everybody's going to be thrilled with you. If Jimmy over there misses a big three, when it matters for us, they're going to know he shot 4,000 threes every week for 10 weeks. So when he misses it, they're going to feel bad for him. They're going to be in his corner. When you miss it, they're going to know you've shot as little as possible and you just think you're a, num a number one and you don't need to practice. And they're going to be pissed at you. And they should be because you missed it because you refused to practice. So as long as we understand what happens if he misses a shot to win the game and if you miss a shot to win the game. So you can keep doing what you're doing, but just don't miss a shot to win the game because – People aren't going to be happy. Yeah, I love that. I think it's a tremendous way to <clears throat> be able to motivate guys who might otherwise be unmotivated. And I'm guessing that more often than not, especially with the type of practice environment that you've obviously created, that the guy that you just described there who doesn't work very hard at his shooting, I'm guessing those guys are fewer and further between than, than, the guy, than the guys who take it very seriously and Plus, really want to get out there. It's not fun to practice if, you can't, if, if you're a three-point shooter, but you're not allowed to shoot threes. Yeah, I wouldn't think that'd be much fun. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, uh, and, and I mean, he's allowed to shoot threes in games because he's a three-point shooter, but he's not allowed to shoot threes in practice. That's not fun. I mean, we, we practice hard two hours and 15 minutes of not being able to shoot a three. Yeah, I would not want to do that. I would definitely want to get to the top of the shooting chart so I could shoot with impunity. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, next thing. I want to ask you a little bit about the competitiveness in your drills. And one of the things that I heard you say when you were uh, on the podcast with Chris Oliver, you talked about how you like when guys figure out how to game or cheat a drill. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and what it is about those types of players that find those little quirks in your drills, what what that tells you about them? Well, I, I mean, you know, what, what I like about it is, is a few things. I mean, first of all, if they're trying to find ways to win, they're, it shows that they're competitive. They, 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 it shows that they understand that, that winning matters. And, and some people will say, well, it, it, it's cheating. And it's like, yeah, is it cheating? I mean, is the cheating, I mean, is what James Harden doing cheating? I mean, he, he uses the rules to his advantage and he, for a long time, he, he, he tends to get a lot of calls that maybe other people don't get now. I mean, it, it runs its course and he, and sometimes you don't get the calls after a while, if you do it too much and you don't change, change your stick, stick, but, you know, the bottom line is no one calls him a cheater. They, 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 he, he finds ways to make, shoot more foul shots than everybody else. And, and, you know, it's the same thing in the drills. If, if, if they can find ways to, to cheat the drill, to give themselves a chance to win, you know, I, do I, do I keep the drill the same way? No, I, I change the drill because obviously if they cheat the drill, they, they don't get as good as they could get. But that's on me. I mean, I need to make sure the drill's set up where they're doing the things that I need, like they need to do to get better, and I need them to do to get better. Um, but I want them thinking. I want them thinking of ways to to win. I mean, some people call it shortcut the drill. I call it finding ways to win. You know, it's 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 one of those things where if there's a weak link, attack it. You know, and, and attack it until until it's no longer a weak link. And you know, it, it, we're, you're playing competitive sport. If you, if if you don't want to be part of getting attacked as the weak link, there's house league in everything. There's 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 intramural in everything. Like go play it. But if you're gonna play competitive sport and you're the weak link, you better be expected to to get attacked and and to get constantly attack until you figure out a way to to make sure you're not the guy to get attacked and and some people have said well it 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 produces a, a bully mentality and it's like 
I, I guess, but unfortunately, that's what sports is. Like, you get on the floor and someone's someone shouldn't be on the floor. If the other team's trying to win, they just attack that guy. So they might as well learn it in a practice as opposed to learning it in a game. You know, and, and if you fight hard enough, no one wants to try to bully you because it's not worth it. They can find someone else who won't fight as hard as you will. So I don't like to use the word because you're not allowed to use the word in this in 2019. But make no mistake, if you're watching the NBA playoffs, everybody's getting bullied. That's all the game is in the half court. Is Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Just bully try bully. to find, find, play, find player weakness and attack it. There's no doubt that that's what the NBA game, especially in the playoffs, has become is you find the weakest guy and the weakest, the, the best matchup and you go after it and attack it. And yeah, it's, I think basketball has always been that way, but nowadays I think the coaching and the analytics and everything has become so much more sophisticated in that way that it becomes so much easier, especially in the playoffs where you're playing the same team over and over and over again. And you have an opportunity to prepare that it, if you have a weakness, it's it's gonna it's gonna be found by the NBA staff of seven, eight, nine guys who are you know being paid lots of money to be able to figure out what your weaknesses are. Oh yeah, and I, I would say if you went to a, a TV sort of prep prep situation before every single game, there's got to be a, a two day weekend course on how to talk about them bullying players without actually saying the word bully. <laughs> they have a million ways to make it sound like something nice without just saying what it is. They are bullying that guy. But, you know, like they don't say it on TV because that'll get them in trouble. I, th- I, think the, I, think the only, I think the only group that could probably get away with it is the NBA on TNT guys, like Chuck, right. Shaq. They could, they could, I'm pretty sure they could pretty much say anything they want to say and they can get away with it. But that's what the game is, you know. That that's what they're what everybody is doing. Sometimes they're bullying whoever can't defend. Sometimes, you know, like you know, I went to the Milwaukee Celtics game and it was Marcus Smart's first game, and they didn't cover him. They just basically said shoot it. And I mean, he can shoot it. He's a great player. But his first game, he made one, and he the worst part was he knew he wasn't going to make shots, so he stopped taking them which hurt him hurt the team more than him missing them and but i mean that that is a form of of whatever you want to call it but you know so in practice guys gotta they, they can they can find angles on the drill they they got to figure out who who to attack they they, they got to figure out all those things if they can figure out angles on the drill then it's good for me because it makes me a better coach it makes it makes me think more about how to make sure they can't take advantage of it in any drill and and that in every drill they're going to have to do the things that I want them to do and want them to get better at. And I mean, the point system is always the best way to to control the drill. Let them play, but set the points up in a way where they just get penalized if or rewarded if they do the things that we need to do well or penalized yeah, if they continue to do things that we haven't been doing. Well. All right, I have two questions that are both somewhat related. One, do you film your practices and then go back and, and watch practice on film? And then two, how much use of analytics in the last few years did you do? And if you did use it quite a bit, what were some of the things, the metrics maybe that you looked at that you found interesting that you were able to connect to your team's success? Uh, we use film. Uh, we've always used film. We've filmed for 20, 21 years, every, every pra- like practices, and and we use it a, a ton, you know, to go through stuff. We, we film our scrimmages in the summer when it's not all our guys. It's pros and it's guys from other schools, but we film those scrimmages and go through it individually with guys. Um, so we film everything um, and use film religiously. Uh, the analytics, again, it, I, I mean, I, we use it, but honestly, it's kind of like the, 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 everybody talking about the Houston Rockets and they only shoot threes and, and layups. And I'm going like, 
that's all we've shot for 25 years. <laughs> and, and it's, and it's sort of, I, I don't think they're the first NBA team that's only done that. I mean, they, 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 they've talked, they're the only, like, that's the only team that other people have talked about. But I mean, it, it most of this stuff is kind of common sense. I mean, it, it's, it's, and, and again, we use it, but in basketball, it's, it's so hard to get really good analytics because a lot of it comes down to how are they going to play with six minutes left in a tie game in the fourth quarter? And it's going to be full on different than how they're going to play in the first four minutes of any game. I mean, like Joel Embiid, really, uh, how he covers the ball screen? I guess he, I guess he covers it terribly. But you know what? With five minutes left in the game, the fact that he's got a ridiculous wingspan and he moves his feet incredibly well and he's defends the rim and he moves laterally as well as anyone his size, I'm guessing if he tries, which he will in the last five minutes, which he doesn't in the first five minutes, I'm guessing that would be a totally different analytics. So, I mean, until you, those are the types of analytics that I want to see is what is he doing in the last five minutes on a ball screen when it's a close game and all that other stuff. I, I'm not really sure if it matters, you know, now is he as good as he could be if he tried all the time? No, but he's still way better than the analytics would say if you're just looking at general analytics. So, you got to be so precise with the analytics. So we we have certain things that we that we chart that that are pretty precise. Um, but but again, like we we just throw out most blowups. I mean, it, it just because some guys just play well because they're comfortable because you're killing somebody. Um, some guys don't try once you get up, you know, because it's not it's they're they don't love basketball. They like competing, and when it's not competitive, they they're not the same. Um, so we, we generally throw out all that stuff. We are, are, and which means that there's such a small sample size. Usually we just go on common sense, you know, like if I see Joel and B cover a ball screen really well, once I'm going to assume that he's going to try in certain situations. And if he can cover it well, once he'll probably cover it well, then would I go after him early? But it wouldn't be because he can't cover a ball screen. It would be because he doesn't care to at the start of the game. <laughs> Understood. Understood. All right, I want to get your opinion or just thoughts on something that I found to be kind of interesting from the NBA playoffs when Utah was guarding James Harden standing basically behind him on his left side to take away his step back jump shot and basically daring him to go into the lane against Rudy Gobert. What was – when you saw that, what was kind of your feelings in terms of seeing that and, and analyzing? I know when I saw it, I, I guess retrospectively you look at it and I thought, oh, that makes sense. But I never would have guessed there would have been a day of, in basketball where the guy would be guarding his I, <laughs> offensive player. I laughed. Kind of. I laughed when I saw it, so I don't know. I mean, it's tough because when I saw it, there's a lot of things that, you, that I think about when I see something like that. I, I, I go, it's Quinn Snyder. Every, almost every basketball NBA coach I know has a high regard for him and his staff from a technical standpoint. So my first thought is this is insane because it's totally against what I believe is trying to keep the ball out of the paint as much as you can possibly keep the ball out of the paint. For sure. So it's totally against anything I believe, but then I go, you know, like there's got to be a reason. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't even a uh, a guy who's not respected in the NBA. This is a highly respected guy in the NBA. So they've got to have thought about this and come to this in a in a really logical way. So I spent, you know, most of the time that they did it trying to figure out how this was more effective than loading more and just making him pass it to other guys early and getting long closeouts on those guys and having them get in the lane easier and having them have to pass it. Cause I'm a pass guy. I'm, I'm like, make them pass the ball going, doing things they're not comfortable doing and making it as tough a pass as possible. So 
the, the first thought in my mind is always let the ball go to the guy who passes it the worst. And to me, he passes it the second best. I mean, he's, he's loose with it, but he passes it the second best on that team. So it's like now you're just telling that guy we're going to let the second best passer on our team, on your team, get in the lane all day, as opposed to just saying, you know what, I ain't going to cover two of your guys on the perimeter until they get it. And yes, maybe they can shoot it, but I'll run on them and let them get in the lane and make them be passers because they don't pass it very well. And if they can't shoot it, then I won't even close out hard. I, I just didn't understand why you want a great passer in the lane. I, I, I get it if he was a bad passer because I, I don't really have a problem with like letting the ball go to a post who can't pass and then attacking him with a double or a spin or making him a passer because he's he, they're not going to get anything out of it because the guy can't pass. Right. But but Harden, my biggest problem is he can pass. You know, he can really pass. So, I uh, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> you're I, you're I, scratching I, your head the same way I was. That I, yeah, I was looking at that the, going, I just can't. You know their staff have a lot of really good basketball minds. So there had. I, I'd like to hear all the reasoning, not just sort of hypothesize about what you hear people say. I'd like. I would have. I'd like to be in a meeting where they. Right. Where they really discussed all the pros and cons to it. I, I can't even imagine trying to get the players to buy in to do that, by the way. Like, that had to be so weird to them for them to, to do that. So I would love to know their perspective, too, on it. Not that we're ever, not that we're ever going to hear it, but I'd love to know their perspective on it. But it adds to the fact that clearly they respected their coaching staff. So they thought the same thing I was thinking. Like, this is – they may have been thinking, this is crazy, but they're going, but you know what? These guys can coach. They must have come to this – in a really logical way. And maybe they explained their, they, uh, hopefully they did explain the pros and the cons of it and sort of put it to the guys like, okay, here are the pros and cons. Do you think it's better than the alternative? And if the players buy in, then that's the key. If the players buy in, sometimes you can do the dumbest stuff ever if the players buy into it. I mean, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. I see some teams who do the dumbest things ever, but they do it with such confidence. They get away with it until they play someone who also plays with confidence and actually plays the game intelligently. <laughs> that is, that is, that is perfect. I, I, that is a great, great way of talking about teams. And I think about certain players that over the course of time that I've either played against when I was a player or coached against as a coach. And I think that's a tremendous way to put it that, you know, sometimes you eventually run into somebody else who, plays just as hard as you do and plays a little bit more intelligently and you're going to, you're going to be in trouble and that's the case for sure. Yeah. All right. I want to wrap up Dave here by asking you one, uh, fi one final question about kind of, you're going to be transitioning into a, into a new role. So can you talk a little bit about that transition and, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap it up there. Yeah, I have no idea. I'm, I'm, uh, doing my best to, uh, I mean the, 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 the person who took over the men's program had been my assistant for seven years and had been the women's coach for 12. So, you know, I've worked directly with him and he's a close friend. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I think it's going to be a reasonably good transition. I, I'm still going to be heavily involved. I still oversee everything. I mean, he knows, he knows the deal. If, uh, if he, if, as long as the team doesn't lose more than one game a year and <laughs> no pressure, you're not putting any pressure on him. Good no, work. I mean, as good long work. as he does that, I'm not going to get in his way at all. I'm not going to say anything. And if he can't do that, then as long as he takes my suggestions, then I'm good with that too. It's going to be a reasonably smooth transition. And I think we'll, we'll work really well together. The woman's side. I mean, it's a different game for me. I, uh, I mean, I, I've coached, the women's side at the club level for, for 10 years. So I know I, I, I still understand the interactions pretty well from a competitive level. I mean, the, the kids I've coached at that level have all gone on to be pretty high level competitive people. So hopefully the group they have now are, are like those kids. And I think it's, it, it's not, I don't think it's as different as people say it. It's obviously it's different. Um, you know, the, 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 but the transition to the coaches is going to be a little different because we've got an interim coach this year and then someone taking over next year. 
and I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity to work with them, but I don't know them as well as I know the, the men's coach. So, you know, it, it's, it's all a work in progress. You, you, I, I, I think I adapt pretty well. I, I, I think I, I know I'm not like, I, I know I'm going to make a million mistakes. I made a million mistakes when I was coaching and we still want a lot. So you can make a million mistakes as long as you recognize that their mistakes are better, quicker than everybody else realizes their mistakes. So, you know, I'm going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes, but uh, the, the big thing is you just learn from it. And I, I, I'm excited with the new role. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. The fact that it's more of a, you know, an eight to five job and I can coach, coach hockey. I can coach, I can coach uh, my kids in, in basketball. Uh, you know, I, I, I can, I can, I can coach, you know, I'm going to coach, be a head coach of a ton of teams every year. It's just going to be hockey and, and little kids basketball. And then I'm gonna <laughs> two university teams. And then who knows? I mean, it's funny. I've, I've, I get two calls a day about uh, offers to do different things, whether it's coaching, whether it's this kind of stuff, but you know, and, and it, it's, it's all fun for me now. I mean, maybe in two years I'll really miss coaching at that level, but I'll never go back to U Sport. I, I, I mean, I think I've done what I, what I wanted to accomplish at U Sport. Um, would I take a job somewhere else if the right opportunity uh, came about? And my wife and uh, felt that it was my wife and I felt that it was a, a really good situation for my family and obviously for me. But first, my family. Then, then I would certainly. I'll, I'll certainly look at everything, but I, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I mean, it's it's a new role, it's an exciting role, and I get to coach, you know, AAA hockey, which is which is uh, you know interesting in its own right. Well, you never get those years back with your kids and having a chance to coach them in whatever sport that they end up playing, whether it's hockey, basketball. I think is just something that it can't be replaced. And so the fact that you're going to get the opportunity to do that. Uh, I think is tremendous, and uh, like I said, it's those years. Those years don't come back to you. And uh, for anybody who's out there that you know is coaching their own kids and hopefully is is doing it the right way, and you know we could that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother podcast. But uh, regardless, if you get an opportunity to coach your kids and spend time with them through sports, uh, there's nothing better than that. Before we wrap up, Dave, I want to give you a chance to share how people can reach out to you, and I know that. You've got some tremendous videos out there of your practices where people could see some of the things that we talked about tonight actually put into put into practice, for lack of a better term, that they can actually see visually and hear some of the things that we talked about. So if you wouldn't mind, let people know how they can find out more about you, pick up those videos, and reach out to you if they have questions or just want to say thanks for uh, you know, the things that you've shared here on the podcast today. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I – I... I mean, I get a ton of emails, but I certainly would uh, would answer any questions that I could. I mean, it, sometimes it takes me a while to get back because I because I've got a ton of things going on. But I mean, people can email me at Dave Smart at Carlton .ca Carlton with an E C A R L E T O N, um, not the same as uh, I think it, the 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 Carlton College in Minnesota I think spelled a little differently. So um, and then the the videos and everything I think the best route is just going through basketball immersion and, uh, and, and going through uh, that, that website and that uh, and Chris Oliver stuff uh, to get, to get access to those. Dave, we can't thank you enough for jumping on the podcast with us tonight, spending about an hour and 20 minutes uh, of your time to, to share with our audience. And it was a tremendous basketball conversation and we can't thank you enough for jumping on and to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com.
HoopHeads.com. Thanks for listening to the HoopHeads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.